can you use infinite banking for recurring expenses? Well, Nash says, and I say, absolutely. Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents channel. My name is Jesse Durham. For today's quick take, I want to address using infinite banking for recurring expenses. Now, I'll go ahead and say that after podcasting for years now, one of my more popular videos is one from, I think it's 2021, so a few years ago now at this point. It's episode number 38. If you'd like to go back and check out what I sounded like then, what the message was, and and, and now, here in 2024 when I'm recording, a quick take. I spoke more at length then. This is going to be my quick take on recurring expenses. But episode 38, just in case that interests you, go check that out. It seems to be still very popular. Obviously, I would say because it's still so very relevant to the idea of using infinite banking for your recurring expenses. So let's dive right in on this topic. Now, one of the most redeeming qualities, I believe, about Nelson's work in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, his second book, Building Your Warehouse of Wealth, everything that he did in teaching us about the infinite banking concept is that it's for the average American, is that it's for the lay person, is that it's just for me. It's for you. If we choose, if we're open to thinking about this, considering it, vetting it, understanding it, and implementing it, it's just for us regular people, okay? And us regular people have regular recurring expenses, don't we? Absolutely. So when Nelson is in his book talking about appliances, I mean, I just had a hot water heater issue this week, actually, in our home. We're having a, a leak from our hot water heater. So doesn't doesn't stuff like that just happen, right? That something breaks and we need a new one or just being proactively replacing. We do things. We buy things. We have recurring expenses is what I'm saying. I don't believe that was our first hot water heater. Shouldn't be our last. These are regular expenses that we have. Now, some are more regular and recurring than others, but you understand what I'm saying. We buy things over and over and over again. Okay. So what I'll tell you, of course, right now is that in the past and in the future, uh, we don't uh, address or confront, not in our household, because we're our own bankers. We are our own bankers. We don't address these recurring expenses without using our infinite banking lens. With uh, There's no way for us to unknow what we already know. So we're our, our own bankers. We privately finance the things that we do in life to include here, you know, like I say, three years later from the first time that I talk about recurring expenses and infinite banking. And it doesn't matter whether it's our property taxes. It doesn't matter whether it's the hot water heater. It doesn't matter whether it's automobile repairs. We've, we've got a vehicle in the shop actually right now. So all these things that we all have to address and confront, we do it. This is just our lifestyle. This is just our paradigm. This is just our come from and our children, Jacob, Josiah and Lana, 10 years old, eight years old, four years old. They know that we are our own bankers. We use policies to be able to address these things. So let me ask you some questions though, in this quick take on recurring expenses. Think about this. Take whatever cost that you want to. I don't care if it's a subscription. I don't care if it's a monthly expenditure that you have. Just ask yourself this, whatever that cost is, is that likely to go up? The amount of that cost for that item, that one item that I want you to hold in your mind right now, whatever that is for you, just think of one regular recurring expense. Maybe pick the one you don't like. Uh, pick the one that you, you know you're going to pay, but you don't like it. You're not happy about it. You wish you didn't have to. Okay, uh, Take that expense and just ask yourself, is that cost likely to go up? And if it is, and I do believe that it is, shouldn't we be compounding now? Shouldn't we be capitalizing now? Shouldn't we intentionally and proactively? Don't have to. I said, shouldn't we? Couldn't we? Do you have to? No, don't have to. You can keep ignoring it, right? You can spend all that you earn and all those different things that Nash talks about in his book. But if the cost is likely to go up, shouldn't we be compounding and capitalizing today in anticipation of that? I think it would be prudent. Let me ask you another question that I hope will expand our thought the taxation on this expense that you're holding in your mind, is that likely to go up in the future? I would say that it seems likely history would indicate that taxation in every area may increase. So again, shouldn't we be compounding now? Shouldn't we be capitalizing now? And those are two different things. You can capitalize without compounding. 
I don't believe that you can compound without capitalizing. But anyway, this is an interesting thought. Maybe we'll talk more about that. I believe we should be capitalizing and compounding now because we don't know that the cost of things won't continue to go up. We don't know that the taxation on these things won't continue to go up. And then ultimately, my third question is, if you could get multiple jobs accomplished by the same dollars, okay, so we all experience cash flow in whatever level that we experience cash flow, whether you're running a household, whether you have a business, whether you're an investor, no matter what your financial footprint looks like, we all experience a cash flow. Now think about that cash flow and ask yourself before those dollars do go out to some expense, can we get multiple jobs, multiple tasks, multiple items accomplished before those dollars ultimately leave us. I'm saying that when you pay premiums into a properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividends, that money forever for your whole life, pun always intended, for your whole life, those dollars are going to be capitalizing in that policy and compounding. They are going to create properly structured. That's important. They are going to create multiples of themselves in the future, in the death benefit and in the cash value. So at the back end, the death benefit, intergenerational transition of tax-free wealth, okay? And in the cash value, meaning that in the future, you will have multiples to be able to address, multiple dollars to be able to address the same issue that you're seeking to address today, whatever that recurring expense is. Because if we enjoy cars today, we'll probably enjoy transportation, whatever it may look like five years from now, 50 years from now. Yes? Okay. So whatever that recurring expense happens to look like, why shouldn't we try and accomplish multiple jobs with the dollars that we have today? And if you know these things, if you know that the cost of this recurring expense is likely to go up, if you know that taxation is likely to go up, and once you do know and you understand that you can accomplish multiple jobs with the same dollars, why wouldn't you get started? When would you want to get started? How many of those entities that could compound your capital would you want to have? I mean, these are all valid and relevant questions to addressing recurring expenses that we all have. And all of these expenses, and I'll, I'll show you this, all of these expenses can be addressed in these two conventional ways. The two conventional ways of finance are, and everything is finance, are credit and cash. Credit and cash. See how I made both of those a C? I think that's cool. Uh, there's a third mystery one, which is going to be compounding. I'll go ahead and tell you, right? But the credit way, and there are lots of questions to ask about credit. Are we assuming risk? Are we paying interest? Are we fronting collateral? Lots of valid questions. But you go down into debt, and you slowly build out of it. End result, zero. End result, zero. Okay? Cash. For all my cash is king, folks. You save up spend save up spend save up and spend every time that that expense is you got to save up for it if you're going to go the cash route beforehand and people don't put a time value on money that's so important but then we spend and again the net result is it puts us back at zero well that mystery way of finance is is not the conventional route of cash or credit it's compounding it's we could compound our cash flows over our lifetime to be able to address our need of finance, to be able to address recurring expenses. And the philosophy, the principles, the paradigm, it's all right here in Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash. And the product as well. The product as well. The properly structured whole life policy with a mutual company that pays dividends. This is the lifestyle that we've assumed for addressing recurring expenses is we buy these properly structured whole life policies from mutual companies that pay dividends. We've built a system of them over the better part of a decade now. And from our privatized banking system, we address our need for these re recurring expenses, whatever they may be, our vehicles. And this is a really appropriate time to remind us of the average all-American spreadsheet that Nash has in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, where he shows how much goes to autos, how much goes to housing, how much goes to lifestyle, and then how much goes to savings. He's very generous on savings. It's probably off base completely because the average American is not saving. But in that conservative look, you see where the vast majority of our dollars go. And when you really realize how much of that expense is actually interest, which again brings us back to banking. Who controls the banking function in your life? If you could keep all of the interest that you would typically pay with conventional financing, 
on your recurring expenses, if you could keep that, how much more control would you have? How much more financial independence and autonomy would you have over the banking function in your life? And therefore, how much more profitability would you have? So this has been a great pleasure for me. Again, if, if you would let me know here or on episode 38, what you think about infinite banking for recurring expenses. If you'd share anything, any of our clients, anybody like to put anything in the comments about how you've used infinite banking for your recurring expenses, that would be neat to be able to see. I've told you some of mine. And again, if this quick take or any of our content has been valuable, what I'd like to ask you is to subscribe to our channel. I know if you're listening to this right here at the end of the video that you are an avid listener, that you are intentional about growing and expanding your thinking and probably what it is that you're doing or wanting to do in the infinite banking space. You're vetting this concept or you've already implemented this concept and you're continuing your learning. I commend you. It would mean a lot to me if I could see you subscribe, not so much for the metrics, but to be able to know that you've made it to the end of this video that it does bring value to you. That's what matters to me. And if you'd like to have a conversation about what it could look like for you to implement the infinite banking concept, I've got my presentation. I've got my contact information on our website. That's DurhamTalents.com. This has been a great pleasure for me. I hope you have a great day. Take care.